Good morning. <laughs> Running a couple of seconds behind schedule here. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to worship on this beautiful kind of taste of summer, isn't it? Sunday morning, kind of muggy even out there, but a warm day and the air conditioning is on and nice. Uh, let me know if it's uh, too cold and we can adjust that as we go through the, the summer months. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm just uh, heart sick at another tragic uh, shooting in our country and in our state even, and we'll reflect on that a bit together today in prayers and in message. Um, and uh, so words can't adequately describe what we are feeling, I'm sure, but we will, we will uh, lift it, our hearts to the Lord together and work together to build a country where these things don't happen. Well, as, as we uh, come together for worship, of course, we have so much to be thankful for and so much to praise God for. And so that is, of course, what we are going to do as we begin worship together. So at the sound of the bells, please join together in the call to worship as you see it printed in your bulletin. Let us worship God. Come, all who are weary. Come, all who are heavy laden. Come, all who have hope. Hear these words. Let us be renewed with worship.
Thank you for that wonderful singing and you know, that beautiful hymn. Has that line, this Easter day. Oh, sing this Easter day. Of course, Easter is a season and not just a day. And so we sing it together. Let us join together in our prayer of confession as we acknowledge our need for God's grace in our lives. First in unison, sharing this prayer together and then pausing for a moment of silent and personal prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, you who are always doing a new thing, we confess that we sometimes close windows against the fresh air of new ideas, against the noise of other people's worries, against the winds of change. God of every place and time, we confess that we often draw the curtains against people who are different, against world news or community concerns. Forgive us our isolation in our locked homes, our shuttered churches, the security systems on our hearts. Open up our lives and let us be renewed by your spirit. Amen. When we chose that prayer of confession earlier in the week, I had no idea how appropriate it would be for this day. Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. All right, let us go to prayer and we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, we gather in your presence as people with heavy hearts. While we have much to be thankful for and we lift your name in praise and adoration, the burden of grief and sadness weighs heavily on us this day. We find it hard to imagine that such evil and hatred exists in the youth of our state. We feel safe in our community, but we know our neighbors who are Jewish or Muslim or black or Latino do not feel safe. Forgive us for tolerating any hint of racism in our culture and in our hearts. Help us to teach our children well. We thank you for our children and our youth who have inspired us with their love for you and for family and for others. We pray for peace in places where violence and war prevail. We pray especially for peace in Jerusalem, even as we watch for the new Jerusalem that will come with your new heaven and your new earth. We pray for all those who are near and dear to us, who are sick this day, who are grieving, or recovering from illness or surgery, those who are struggling with loneliness, mental illness, and other afflictions. We pray your blessing upon them and help us to reach out to one another with a helping hand and a word of comfort and encouragement. We pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As Nita comes to read the psalm of the day for you, 
Uh, what a joy it has been to have our Confirmation Youth reading scripture each Sunday. As we move beyond next Sunday, we'll need more scripture readers. So we'll have a start having a sign-up out available for that in the coming weeks. Thank you, Nina. The first reading today is from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy winds fulfilling his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of earth and all people, princes and all rulers of earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. This is the Lord, this is the word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading comes from the penultimate chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21. In fact, I was pleased as I went to look at the, how the children's Bible ended this story, so to speak, the, and out of all the verses and chapters of Revelation, it chose this section to summarize uh, how, the book of the, how the Bible ends for children. So chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. The Revelation of St. John. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, you've probably heard us talk about that during Lent, we studied our Presbyterian Book of Confessions and our most recent confession called the Brief Statement of Faith of the Presbyterian Church ends with these words. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. I don't know when I've felt the power of those words more than I do right now. We need that new heaven and that new earth, and we need it now. Come, Lord Jesus. What are you waiting for? Yesterday, as I watched a news conference of Buffalo political leaders and law enforcement officials talk about this latest hate crime perpetrated on a largely black community, I just started to weep. 
Perhaps I was just tired. <laughs> We'd gotten home from our trip to our son's concert in Wilmington, Delaware at uh, close to 2 a.m. the night before. I was tired in body for sure, but I was tired in spirit as well. I felt the words, how much more can we take, come to my mind. Felt like our state, our country, our world is falling apart. The political divisions and conspiracy theories, the potential disruption of long-settled legal precedents, the state of the economy, the condition of the planet, and the war in Europe are upsetting us all. But perhaps the most panic-inducing problem is the shortage of baby formula. Who would have known? We've been trying to help our son and daughter find formula for our eight-month-old grandson, but the shelves are empty everywhere. Come, Lord Jesus, what are you waiting for? I'm sorry for the depressing uh, start to this sermon, but that is precisely the way the book of Revelation came into being. John, the author of Revelation, was arrested by the Roman authorities. Tradition says they tried to execute him by dipping, dropping him into boiling oil, but he survived miraculously, and so they sent him into exile. Not so sure about that apocryphal story, but he was nonetheless sent into exile as a prisoner to the island of Patmos. Patmos. For him, the world was coming to an end. The followers, followers of Jesus were under persecution everywhere. There was no hope for anything better in this life, so his thoughts took him to a place where all things would be made new. And once again, the church calendar has given us just what we need. This Sunday and again in two weeks, we have two readings from the book of Revelation. The last book of the Bible that we Presbyterians don't spend much time with. We like the Gospels and the miracles of teachings of Jesus. We like the theology and the advice of the Apostle Paul, even some classic Old Testament stories. But we don't know what to do with the book of the Revelation. But we're in good company. Luther wrote in his preface to his com commentary on Revelation, and I quote, About this book of the Revelation of John, I leave everyone free to their own opinion. I would not have anyone bound to my opinion or judgment. I say what I feel. I, more, I miss more than one thing in this book, and it makes me consider it to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. Luther was frustrated that he did not see Christ plainly or clearly in all the strange imagery and visions. But at least he tried, and he went ahead and wrote a commentary. John Calvin didn't even try. He wrote a commentary on almost every other book of the Bible, but he never even tried with the revelation of John. Mainline Protestant preachers have mainly left this book to the domain of the end times prophecy folks. I grew up in that culture. If I came home and no one was there, I'd be scared that everyone had been taken up in the rapture and I had been left behind. There's a whole best-selling book series with that title, title, Left Behind. 65 million copies sold. It takes books like Revelation and Old Testament books like Daniel and tries to see the current events in the wild visions of the beasts and the power of Babylon and the final battle of Armageddon. You may, may remember Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth that went into great detail with all this stuff and he sold millions and millions of copies in the 70s and 80s. The only problem is that's not how we are supposed to read the book of Revelation. Jesus himself said in the gospel that no one knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man would return and said it was foolish to look for a sign and to try to predict it. I think those end times pre preachers conveniently overlook those words of Jesus. But it is also a mistake to overlook the revelation of John. It's kind of crazy and wild and hard to understand, but ultimately it gives us hope. Hope for a new heaven and hope for a new earth. Hope for the day when death and war will be no more. Without a vision, the people perish. Revelation is a vision that gives a vision of what can be and adds the conviction that it will be because God said so. 
We know that Revelation is a vision and it is not meant to be taken literally. John himself says so in the first chapter, I, John, your brother, was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. When he turned to see who was speaking, he saw Jesus, the Son of Man with stars in his hand and a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth with his face shining like the sun. It's hard to take that image, literally. I was thinking of John's vision of the Revelation at that concert of the Delaware Symphony that we attended on Friday night. It was an all-French program that ended with Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique, which is a piece of music depicting a vision vision of a man that went from admiring a beautiful woman to overdosing on opium and imagining his own execution. <laughs> it's bizarre. But it's a dramatic piece of music that no one takes literally, the, the story part literally. But it speaks to unrequited love, which some say was the motivation for the symphony, and tells a beautiful story. If we let Revelation speak through its Im imagery and its symbolism, it has a powerful message. It describes the end of all things. It is the bookend to Genesis, which gives us the story of creation. Revelation gives us the story of the new creation. The verses we read from the 21st chapter, to, chapter are filled with beautiful, hopeful imagery. They're some of the most beloved words of Scripture. We share them at funerals and after tragedies. God will wipe every tear from their eyes death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one seated on the throne, and that's Jesus, of course, said, see, or behold, I am making all things new. Out of the chaos of John's world, which had been turned upside down, the Spirit gave him a vision that included this promise, behold, I am making all things new. Back in 2004, Mel Gibson produced a rather strange movie about the life of Jesus called The Passion of the Christ. It was an unusual movie because the dialogue was all in Aramaic with subtitles and it focused on the suffering and torture of Jesus to the extreme. A friend and I went to see it in Portland, Oregon, and the theater was so full we had to sit in the very front row. Have you ever had to do that in a theater? <laughs> I hate watching any movie from that angle, but to watch the brutal beating and crucifixion of Jesus from that close was a little overwhelming. But my favorite moment, moment of the movie was when Jesus uttered these words, see, I am making all things new. The screenplay writer took liberties as these words, of course, are from Revelation, not the gospel. But they had Jesus say them as he was on the Via Della Rosa, the way of suffering, carrying his cross through the streets of Jerusalem on the way to Calvary. And the beautiful part of that scene was the way his mother Mary came running to him. As she heard him stumble and fall under the weight of the cross, she remembered running to pick him up when he fell and hurt himself as a little boy. With a mother's love, she ran once again to her son. And as she took his bleeding face in her hands, he said, See, I am making all things new. And he stood up with the cross and put one foot in front of the other to continue his journey. It didn't seem like anything new or good was about to happen, but that's the paradox at the heart of the gospel. That's the power of the resurrection. New life emerges from death. Healing comes through pain and suffering. A new thing emerges after the old has come to pass. That was true for Jesus. That was true for John. And that is the message of the revelation, and that is the promise for you and me. But what is that new thing? What will a new heaven and a new earth look like? What does it mean to be making all things new? John's vision in the revelation gives us some clues he writes near the end of his vision, after all the bloody battles which brought an end to the empires of this world, he wrote, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the new earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
And I heard a voice saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be God's people, and God will be with them. Notice the new heaven and the new earth was a city, the new Jerusalem. It was not a return to the Garden of Eden. It was not a return to some idyllic vision of nature. It was a vision of a city, a new city, a city where God was right there with the people. It was a city with running water, the water of life that will quench every thirst. The message of Revelation is that God is in the process of creating the new heaven and the new earth. The new city is the city God wants us to build here and now. We are not to head for the hills and get ready for the end times. We are to go to the streets of the city and pick up where Jesus left off. He is making all things new through us. We need to make all things new by ending gun violence and racism and war. We need to make all things new by building an economy that provides opportunity and resources for all, not just a few. We need to make all things new by taking care of the planet before it is too late. We need to make all things new so that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. We can't do it on our own, and we don't have to. God is with us now, and God will be with us in the future. God's dwelling place is with God's people. We are not alone. I open this sermon with the last words from the brief statement of faith. So I thought it was appropriate I'd close with the last words from my own statement of faith that I shared with our confirmation youth as they were asked to write their own statements of faith. I wrote this in 2012 when I was being interviewed to become your pastor, and these words are still true for me today. This is how I ended my statement of faith. The world needs our message of inclusive love and hope. Our cities, nation, and world are full of prejudice and hatred because of ignorance and fear. God's gift of diversity is twisted into judgment and condemnation. The reign of God offers a vision of a new reality that will someday be fully realized in a new heaven and new earth. Until that day, and as long as God gives me breath, I will continue on that journey. Let's continue on that journey together. Let's take up our cross and follow Jesus as he makes all things new. Amen. for that good playing of a little tricky hymn, but the, the words are so appropriate for the day. We just had to choose one more Easter hymn for this season. I want to share with you a little anecdote of life in ministry. I was um, going to go to a meeting at the uh, Temple Bet Torah here a couple summers ago, and the res we were working on a response to uh, the killing of George Floyd. And uh, we were talking about the massacre at the uh, synagogue in Pittsburgh from the year before. And uh, I said a foolish thing. I said, well, that, that moment is kind of past. Like, I mean, it wasn't in the headlines anymore. And Rabbi Aaron and said, not for us, meaning the Jewish community and the security around Temple Bet Torah here in Mount Kisco is significant. It's hard to get in that building. And it needs to be because they face the constant threat and fear. We don't feel that way, do we? I don't feel that kind of fear and threat to my person. And yet, in our country now, mass shootings of Latinos in El Paso, Texas, in Buffalo, New York, Jews, Muslims, folks, we need that new heaven and that new earth. Let us go and pick up where Christ left off and continue, take up our cross and follow him. Come join us for a time of coffee, and then let's head upstairs. Those of you who are going to join our church today, a couple elders and a couple of families are going to join us, and we'll meet you up there at about, say, 11.15 or so. But let's come and have a few minutes of fellowship together first. Receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and all God's people said. Amen.